Well, now, now we get to welcome Kevin Cahill. He is a change maker, both in speaking and coaching and also as an author. So I am excited for this conversation for him to share his wisdom. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you, Anne, for having me today. It's an absolute privilege and honor to chat with you about this very important subject. Hmm, yes, absolutely. So for those in the audience that don't know you yet, can you tell them a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, I live in Canada. Uh, we're hopefully getting out of winter soon. The I grew up in a rural town. My father, uh, my story really started when my father stopped drinking two years before I was born. He, um, uh, long story, but it really saved my parents' marriage. Mm -hmm. And two years later I was born, but three years after that, my father was crushed by an elevator. Uh, mm -hmm. He was an elevator mechanic. And I grew up with a disabled father who was around all the time. And it was uh, both a, a blessing and a curse. And it was something I didn't really realize until uh, he uh, passed away actually 13 years ago this week. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's one where I reflect on my youth and my parents' marriage was definitely not perfect, mm -hmm. um, but it definitely planted a lot of the seeds for the future. Like all individuals, I went through my own challenges and, and suffering throughout my early adult life. And currently, my passion is surrounding the, the three questions that truly circumambulate every single system of life. And that is, how do you prepare for change? How do you go through suffering? How do you learn to accept joy out of the suffering? And then most importantly, how do you mature and serve? Because if you can't figure out a way to give back, then what's the point of going through the pain in the first place? Yeah, wow. I love how you have a nice structure for that. Um, and those are so pertinent questions. So this, we get to apply those questions to understanding change as it pertains to relationships, right? It's particularly marriage, since our audience is geared to uh, the marriage audience. And so let's just take it from the, the, the first question is, will you restate it? How do you prepare for change? Okay. You know, and it is truly one, especially in all relationships, you know, we are um, a very arrogant species, us humans, that we're, you know, sitting on this rock that's been around for four and a half billion years, hurtling through space at 67,000 miles an hour, constantly moving forward, constantly changing. And yet we as humans, resist change and we don't want to change we run away from change but everything that surrounds us everything we learned as a child everything we observed in our own family dynamic every book we read every television show we watch that's really planting the seeds for how are we going to take all of that information when life whether it's a tsunami that comes and covers us or it's a silent nudge of the universe that is trying to whisper in our ear telling us to go in a different direction what are we going to do with that moment and you know all relationships whether they're romantic or friendships or or even uh, professional relationships they're all here to teach us something and usually we uh, are presented with the same individuals over and over and over again until we actually learn that lesson. And I see this a lot in you know, younger relationships, teenage, early 20s, where it's you know, one partner to the next partner to the next partner. And at the end of the day, they're all exactly the same uh, metaphor or symbolism that is being presented but we're usually so caught up in our own selves that we refuse to pay attention to what the universe is actually trying to tell us. Yes, well, absolutely, because we're kind of stuck in our subconscious mind and the things that we adopted to uh, growing up. And so we move into these things without a real conscious awareness. Uh, and if we're not conscious about what we're doing, then we repeat what we're doing instead of making those changes. And so what would you say would be some, because every relationship 
does change. There's there's going to be change in the relationship. Um, how, what would you say is a good place to start with handling the changes that come your way? Having awareness to the change, you know, and, and I think about in all stages of relationship, you know, there's that early stage where it is fun and exciting and there's a newness to it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if the relationship progresses and then all of a sudden, you know, engaged or marriage, well, that's a change. Mm -hmm. All change, good or bad, mm -hmm. is loss. All change, you know, if you get a, a promotion at a job, you have to grieve the loss of the old job in order to truly embrace the new job. And right. so for those that go from, you know, the excitement and the, the, the fire of dating to then all of a sudden they're an engaged couple, well, that's a change. Mm -hmm. And there's different things that come in our society around those words. Mm -hmm. And then to move forward to marriage again, you know, there is that newness to it, but an, a young marriage is not the same as that first two weeks of dating or first two months of dating. And a lot of times in my experience and those that I speak with, they want in that early stage of the marriage, the same things that happened when they were dating. But again, I'll go back to my comment about this rock hurtling through space is that's you know maybe possible for one or two days but the reality is, is you evolve into different roles and different responsibilities and lifelong learning about the role mm -hmm. and what you know in our culture when we have you know over a 50 percent divorce rate of marriages you know in our current day a lot of the where the challenges is we're not adapting and we're not evolving to the changing roles in the relationship you know and a lot of big part of this is is evolutionary biology if we understood you know caveman our prehistoric brains our amygdala and how we're hardwired from you know hundreds of thousands of years ago that we still bring forward with us today that going from marriage to all of a sudden children mm -hmm. you are really throwing uh, a bowling ball into uh, an already rocky situation and if you don't learn to adapt to those changing roles mm -hmm. then eventually the couple will start to uh, distance themselves and forget about where they came from and what that united purpose actually is going forward yeah well i love what you said even about every change you know has the you know grief and the joy in it right which is so true i can think over and over again even in you know newlyweds getting married you're you're giving up certain aspects of um you know maybe what you would think is freedom until you learn to really connect with your partner and it's in that learning to be attentive learning to be aware learning to be curious and and lean in that you start to see more and more of what the blessings are whatever the change is and so uh yeah you're absolutely right if if the relationship is rocky when kids come in it usually furthers the chasm um, moving forward um so you know for you as you think in terms of the the process within relationship and the changes within relationship um you know what do you see as being the things that people need to remember to be able to navigate those things what do you see as being those key points um that as they think about whatever the change is maybe the spouse got a different job maybe somebody's health is changing in some way there's the different phases of having littles having high schoolers having college students and and being empty nesters there's just so many different changes what are the key things that you would say as they're facing a change somebody's facing a change in life these are the things you want to look at these are the things you want to think about the phrase and it's interesting because uh, 
you know, bit about a minute or so ago, you made the comment about staying curious and staying open. And, and those are all those things that we never learn as children. They don't teach us that in school. The most important lessons that we, we need to learn in this lifetime on this earth, we never learn until we go through it. Mm -hmm. And what I always say to, to every individual, regardless of the change they're going through, is to ask themselves, what is this moment trying to teach me? Mm -hmm. And I can guarantee the answer once they dive deep enough into that question is to become more compassionate and more empathetic, not only to self, but to others. And what I see in usual um, relationships, uh, as well as individual uh, challenges, is when life presents us with change. And if we do not learn to mitigate that change properly, good or bad, then we are plunged into what I tag the, the second stage of change, and that is suffering. Mm -hmm. All mystics through all time have called it by different names. It could be the dark night of the soul. It could be the hero's journey as Joseph Campbell so aptly coined, you know, or it could be a simple, any watch any disney movie and it's always the same storyline they always follow the same storyline yeah. is when we are in the darkness when we're in the gutter whether it is you know we've fallen uh, ill health or an addiction has taken us over or you know, financial challenges what is this moment trying to tell me mm -hmm. and understanding that you're also not alone mm -hmm. you're never alone everyone at some point in time has gone through maybe not exactly the same thing you're experiencing but something similar and again we humans in our arrogance we don't like reaching out for help because we've been told in our society that reaching out for help makes us weak and reaching out for help is a sign that you know we cannot handle at all because all of the messages you know the fire hose of information that we're bombarded with in our daily lives is about swifter stronger faster you know get more be more do more mm -hmm. but when you are actually in the suffering if you don't reach out for help and very few of us on this earth have the capacity to be able to get through that darkness alone and in my own darkness you know i didn't have the people around me so i went to the library and i read and i listened to podcasts and i listened to things like this to learn from other people how can i get through this mm -hmm. and understanding that we're all going at different speeds we all have our own experiences we all have our own history we in every relationship we come to the table with hundreds of thousands of years of pre-programmed bullshit that we bring to a relationship and it's everything from our past and you know the study of epigenetics is really starting to come to the forefront now to be able to see how you know something that happened three or four generations ago actually yeah. impacts our ability to make conscious decisions in today's moment. So when I encourage people to, to ask that question, what is this moment trying to teach me? It really uh, engages individuals to step back and observe their thinking, observe their words, observe what they're doing, and try to learn from what that moment is actually trying to tell them. Yes, yes. Well, absolutely. And I, you do bring up a really good point with the whole epigenetics factor that is more of a new, newer aspect to the way that we see things. But the reality that those previous generations, those, uh, I think the latest research was like three or four generations back are impacting the way that we react or the way that we view the world or the way that we 
see things. And I, I personally do have a biblical view on life. And so I find it very interesting that the scripture says, you know, to the third and fourth generation, I, I see a definite lineup there with the scripture. And so um, as we think about that, you know, that awareness that you're referring to, you know, pausing and saying, okay, what am I, what am I seeing here? What's going on here? What you're saying about what is this moment trying to teach me? Um, looking at what's underneath, not just operating on what's on the surface. A hundred percent. And I see this in so many um, relationships and also in my own world is understanding that, you know, what individuals say or do to me has very little to do with me. It has a lot more to do with, you know, where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. And, and again, as you know, we're heading we're about two or three weeks away from Easter and that famous line that is shared on every single Good Friday Mass around earth, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Mm -hmm. And that is one where, and I just live that principle every day, mm -hmm. is people do whatever they're pre-programmed to do. And I can't, I have to be compassionate and empathetic towards others. And then that helps me be able to see the world with more loving eyes. Yeah. Well, it's interesting as you say that, because really what you're, what you're saying in that, you know, we, we do have the subconscious bias about X, Y, or Z because of our upbringing. And really we're talking about being humble enough to realize we have our own right? So when somebody comes to us with something that maybe we're uncomfortable with or that um, we are offended by or whatever to be able to come back to, you know what? We're all the same. We're all the same. We have different backgrounds, different mechanisms. I can choose to react to your mechanism or I can choose to respond to your mechanism. And if I'm going to respond, I'm going to be coming from a place of humility recognizing that you're not wrong i'm not wrong i get to be curious about understanding you and when we get to work together on this and and when it comes to relationships that you're committed in right all the more where you're looking at you know if i choose to walk around in this relationship and be judgmental and self-righteous because i think i know it's only going to implode because it's going to breed what you give it right so versus that you know the position that of christ of you know forgive them they know not what they do and we're all in the same boat none of us you know that know the impact of some of our um behaviors for good or, or for negative and to be able to be humble enough to receive feedback on that and be willing to look at with then what you're also talking about with the compassion and the empathy to come out uh, in the process. And having children is an amazing mirror because not only are they watching and absorbing what you say and what you do, but they have a really good way of throwing it back in your face at the worst possible moment and calling you out on you know, whatever negative behavior you're actually propagating into the world. So true. So true. And at every stage, I mean, I think when they get older and they're able to articulate clearly, it becomes more clear what your role is in participating in that. And yet when they're young, sometimes it's as simple as the anxiety or the tantrums or the, um, disregard that can come up you know i want my own toy i'm going to bang you over the head with my truck and and take your toy or you know um but all of that really does come from the environment right so like what you were saying earlier about um i think you said billions of years or and i think in terms of feedback that is happening right there and then right when somebody is looking at their child reactive or not um, easy to get along with or <laughs> whatever the, the question becomes what environment am i nurturing right because genuinely children are curious children are playful right um doesn't mean that they're exempt from being selfish but um 
we can nurture that out of them, the curiosity. A hundred percent. And again, you know, sticking with the biblical reference, you know, Jesus speaks to the the being childlike and you know the the becoming that going back to that stage of being reborn, not necessarily going back into your mother's womb, but to find that curiosity that does come as a child. And it's one where I, I firmly believe as we are put on this earth to learn a lesson and we're going to keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again until we learn the lesson because it's this life is not uh, a linear line it very much is circular and we constantly come back to the same situations over and over again where at once we thought we knew the answer but we're always invited to see deeper truths and that you know, in every relationship, that truly is the gift of two people being together, is learning, growing, and walking this sacred divine path that we've been given the gift for. Sure, yeah. And, and when you're saying the circular, um, say more about what you mean by that. Um, well, for that, and you know, we're blessed in up here in Canada with the four seasons, you know, spring, summer, fall, winter, every year, it's that cycle of life. It is constantly moving forward, but it's always coming back to regenerate itself and to go back, you know, where they each uh, follow. And the Easter tradition in the Jesus story is very similar to that. You know, Holy Thursday, we're really from Palm Sunday to Holy Thursday is all about how do you prepare for change? The whole message is change is coming. I'm giving you all of the tools, all of the wisdom. This is what you need to know. Good Friday, the power of suffering. The whole story is about suffering. And then on the Easter vigil on the Saturday, how do you find the joy out of that death? right? The light in the darkness. That's where it begins. Every single story in the Bible is, is about finding that light inside the darkness. And then on Easter Sunday is the proclamation, the, you know, the being able to go out and spread the message. And in life, it's the same thing for myself. A personal example is after a multitude of failed relationships, I actually sat down and you know, I took pictures and I took notes to realize that every single relationship I had ever been in, they were all identical. Mm -hmm. And they were all trying to teach me the exact same lesson that I wasn't willing to learn. Mm -hmm. you, you know, it is one where we have this whole self-help industry where you could go to a bookstore and there's thousands and thousands of books. And the reality is, is most people will just go, they'll buy the book, they'll read the book, nothing happens to their life, they're still miserable, and then they'll go and buy another book. But mm -hmm. the truth is, is when you dive into your own story and start to see the patterns that have presented themselves in your generation, but also in the generations that have come before you. And I had one coaching client not that long ago where you know, her daughter was going through a very, very dark time. And I asked my client to tell me about her mother. And as soon as I did that, she broke down crying because she realized that, you know, her mother followed a path, then she followed the exact same path. And now her daughter is following the exact same path. And when I say we're put on this earth to learn a lesson, what one generation doesn't deal with the next becomes responsible to learn the lesson and to make sure that it doesn't get passed on to future generations. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, I, we, we glean the way we view the world through the lens of our family and some of that's conscious and some of that's subconscious. And then we walk into, if we don't, what I call, um, if we don't disrupt the dysfunction and create a new path, we're going to just perpetuate the same dysfunction in generations to come versus making a disruption and handling things differently than the previous generations so that the future generations can be blessed and again from my view the biblical lens would say blessings for a thousand generations right so there's those blessings to come when you are the disruption to the 
the familiar uh, patterns, destructive patterns in uh, families. And so absolutely, you know, we will, it, it's, it's actually um, so interesting that people will grow up and say, I, I don't want to be anything like, you know, my parents. And they're so focused on not being like their parents that they're really more focused on being like their parents because the brain cannot not think of something. And so they find themselves against their better desire um, doing the exact things that they didn't want to be like. I spent the majority of my 20s trying to be nothing like my father. And then he passed away and I realized very quickly that I was a hundred percent like my father. And 13 years later, you, you know, there's still elements that will come to me in, in deep meditation where I'm like, wow, you know, that oh, I wasn't thinking about that one, but there's another one where I'm exactly like my parents. Sure. Oh, wow. Yep. That's fun. Um, so <laughs> So you have a gift for the audience. Can you tell the audience a little bit about it? Uh, definitely. A number of years ago in my own journey, I realized in this, again, pattern of being able to leave suffering and find the joy out of the suffering. The biggest obstacle that I had to overcome was fear. And I created a 90-day a uh, online course where I... in and really guide people through understanding where fear started and a lot of the essential steps to be able to overcome fear, but at the same time to outwit fear, because fear is never going to leave our lives. It's always going to be there. And I love uh, Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love and Big Magic. One of her quotes is, fear is allowed to be in the car. It's just not allowed to play with the radio buttons. And that, that is a big part of what I try to encourage is allow fear to be there. Fear has allowed our species to survive for hundreds of thousands of years by keeping us safe. Mm -hmm. So it's important to be there, but it's also very important to not let it control our daily routines. Right, we don't want, uh, when you said playing with the buttons, I, could, I thought we also don't want Fear driving. <laughs> so, yeah, that's great. And what a valuable resource because fear does play such a huge role, um, partially because of all kinds of things like, you know, we, we have negativity bias because we're trying to stay safe and things of that nature. But also it plays a huge role in relationship. We give way to that fear and it keeps us from connecting. It keeps us from the empathy and compassion. It keeps us from really creating the type of relationship we desire when we allow fear to get in the way. And I often tell my clients, you know, you get to work through the fear, right? You risk, risk builds relationships. So um, this will be a great resource for the audience to be able to work through some of the, the ways that they handle fear and to really think about that. I appreciate you sharing it with the audience. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah. Well, this has been a pleasure. I appreciate you taking the time out and I'm sure the listeners are going to get great value. Thank you very much, Anne. Pleasure to be here.